Welcome to the wide world of esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Noor. Today, my guest is Kelly Uyoka, the president of PAXA. Our topic is community esports opportunities to play and competition. Welcome, Kelly. Hi, Catherine. Thanks for having me. All right, tell us about PAXA. <clears throat> yeah, so PAXA is um, one of Hawaii's largest technology systems integrator. integrators. We partner very closely with companies like Microsoft, Oracle, HPE, Dell, and the like. And we, our mission really is to help local organizations succeed through technology. All right, so actually eSports falls precisely into that category. So yeah. what has PAXA done in relation to esports and gaming? You no, know, just as to raise community awareness, um, PAXA has participated in some community effort to bring esports capabilities um, to potentially underserved communities, um, one of which was the Waipahu Library System, where we sponsored um, some really um, cutting edge uh, gaming equipment. Um, and we actually had a tournament um, between the University of Hawaii eSports team and Hawaii Pacific University's team. And that's never happened before. So they were able to play in an exhibition just to show the art of what's possible. Um, it was also a gateway for helping um, raise awareness on computer-based training. You know, it's I was there and I was very impressed that that happened. And, you know, when I think about libraries, I do think about community, but I also think about low tech and books. So how are you integrating tech with those kind of low tech places that we traditionally associate with, you know, paper and books as opposed to technology? Yeah, so I think the concept was to help visualize, you know, the library system becoming sort of like this classroom of the future where we would have accessibility into esports, but also to help people um, come to the library to get credentialed in the IT industry as well. And esports is a catalyst, as you know, um, the I won't say the growing popular popularity of esports, but just the overall phenomenon that it is, um, it, it affords a lot of opportunity. And again, to have uh, something, you know, at the state library system culminate that's never happened before, um, it was kind of exciting. So I think it helped, you know, drive awareness, but ultimately the goal is to have the library system uh, continue to be a place uh, where people can learn. Sure, and so, you have an interesting background, I believe. I think you started out doing some gaming in your life. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I, I started on a Commodore 64, I think, when I was five years old. Um, I don't know how many people recall <laughs> the Commodore 64. I mean, this predates the internet. So I just was fascinated um, by what you could achieve by, you know, typing in commands. <laughs> um, and here I am, you know, maybe so much almost 40 years later. Um, throughout that time, you know, really, it, it just sparked my passion for gaming and technology. And, you know, early on in my career, just the IT industry in general. And so, yeah, I started out as a gamer and I kept going um, to this day, actually. You know, you know, it's really interesting because I've interviewed, interviewed many people on my show that are advocating education in esports and gaming and really discussing how uh, the skills from gaming translate into skills that people might adapt in their future careers. Do you feel that that has happened to you? Are you an example of that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and most definitely. So the skills that I've learned um, throughout you know, my my history and love for gaming um, has definitely opened up awareness just into what's possible, you know, through technology. And I've watched others, you know, youth 
um, who are avid competitors and gamers themselves kind of learn um, the skills that you, that real entry level skills you need um, to be in IT. And so I think that's just happening as an indirect correlation. And so our goal is to try and make direct correlations between how you know the talents in esports can you know help people get get a job in our industry. Sure. And so one of the issues that we always discuss on this show is pushback from parents. When you were five years old and playing on your Commodore, and as you grew up and became more interested in uh, computers and technology. Did your parents support that or how did they they address that? Because I'm sure that they were kind of not that familiar with it. Yeah, they were it, it was a foreign language to them even at the time. And um, you know, I, I'm a former collegiate athlete um, and I should probably mention uh, my father is in the University of Hawaii Circle of Honor for uh, being a captain of the 1955 <laughs> A football team that beat Nebraska uh, in Lincoln. And so as you can imagine, <laughs> his background and his uh, um, understanding of gaming and esports um, as I was growing up seemed like a waste of time. However, however, very quickly, my dad started to play um, uh, video games alongside me. And I think it really opened his eyes to see that, hey, my son has a passion for this, um, this, this digital technology, as opposed to just saying, well, video games are a waste of time, like many other parents, you know, feel. That said, I can see the sentiment changing because the opportunities are far too great uh, to ignore for, you know, parents, um, especially when their their children are just so engaged and passionate about, um, you know, gaming, whether competitive or not. So like anything else, there is a balance to strike between how, you know, much you play um, and, and taking, I mean, taking breaks. I mean, we, we have, we get that advice about, you know, just looking at a computer screen in general. So I think there is a balance that needs to be struck, but nonetheless, um, I, I can see the sentiment changing. Have you also seen whether um, there has been increased opportunities for play in Hawaii, you know, throughout throughout uh, the islands? Yeah, I mean, I, I think as, you know, internet accessibility continues to grow in Hawaii and, you know, the, the capability of our internet um, capacity also continues to grow. I think just in general, there will be a multitude of opportunities. However, you know, getting into gaming is not inexpensive. Um, even, you know, console gaming, uh, it, you know, those consoles can run up to $700 a piece. And then when you consider the titles and how saturated, you know, the market has become with so many with so many popular titles now on the market, um, it, it is not cheap. So I think there are opportunities. However, again, one of the goals, you know, for myself and Paxo was to try and help bring accessibility um, into more of the mainstream um, titles that are played competitively. So are you seeing more and more when you're working with businesses or organizations that the topic of gaming or esports comes up? I mean, in terms of gamification or in terms of, you know, concerns of whether uh, people will be using their computers for playing games or even even recognizing that that's a positive. Yeah, I mean, just being an IT, a former IT administrator myself, I've kind of seen it all. So I, I can say that I've seen organizations, you know, completely block um, esports, you know, during work time, which I, I'm in complete agree, agreement with. However, the gamification aspects, there are things, again, not directly correlated, but there are things from the esports industry that I, I'm starting to see um, in Hawaii permeate, you know, throughout organizations, um, 
whether or not it's it's technology based or not um you know good point on the gamification because i do see that happening and yeah it it's it makes things more engaging and more fun you know i have heard that there are companies that do have um games or esports games competitions in their you know organizations to you know allow for camaraderie with um between employees and and uh management um have you seen that in hawaii at all i not not so much um i have the idea of wanting to do that at my own at our own organization um however you know i think with remote work you know and and that quote unquote hybrid workforce taking over some of those aspects you know from building camaraderie uh, gets lost. However, that said, it is a really good excuse to have people come back into the office and participate that way. Um, so yes, I, I have had the idea. However, I haven't seen that. Um, I haven't seen that out and about as much. So do you, in your work, do you address the issue of latency that we have in Hawaii or a thing? Oh, oh absolutely. A absolutely. That That is a major that is an issue for the industry in Hawaii at large because many organizations are evaluating how to take advantage of cloud computing and between Microsoft, AWS, Google, Oracle, um, you know, perception is many times, most times reality. So having latency between Hawaii and the continental US um, it is an issue. However, I believe there are technologies that are helping us overcome said issues. Now, as it pertains to esports, that still remains a somewhat limiting factor for Hawaii, um, because you know gamers. It, 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 when you add two or three milliseconds, that could mean winning or losing. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that's it's something to there's something to be said about trying to overcome the latency that we experience with that <clears throat> i would also indicate though that hawaii and our unique geography provides an opportunity because latency is cut in half when you play in hawaii and connect to asia which esports is just a global i mean it's just a phenomenon in Asia and the opportunities are just tremendous. So there's that aspect, but for the more casual gamer, yes, the latency in Hawaii is a perceived issue. You know, we, we saw in the, with the Overwatch tournament that was done, um, uh, you know, kind of hosted by University of Hawaii, um, Manoa, uh, that yes. they were able yes. to work with them, you know, that Hawaii became an advantageous location because of latency do you see that uh being a a thing of the future that maybe even um hawaii could be a phenomenal location to attract esports catherine that's exactly what i was referencing i i was referencing the overwatch championships and having the teams from north america fly to or come to hawaii to participate to take advantage of the lower latency that we experience when playing um, in Asia. And that that's a that is the best way, I think, at this time to take advantage of our our geography. Um, and it was very well executed. And you know, I love to see University of Hawaii continue to do what they're doing in esports. And on top of that, University of Hawaii is really competitive. They're really good. And for us to be able to have, um, you know, the Overwatch championships in Hawaii, I always try to, because we talked about parents, I always try to come up with analogies, right, about what that's like. <laughs> that's like, uh, maybe it's like the Super Bowl. I don't know if it's, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, the NBA finals being played in Hawaii or something like that. I don't know. 
but um, it's a big deal. And, um, I, you know, it's really exciting. So I hope that we can continue to foster awareness um, so that we can bring more competitions um, like that to the islands. You know, it's really important to have experts in technology like you weigh in on these things, because a lot of times, you know, we talk about these issues, but don't really know the technical aspects. So I, I want to address another issue that you may or may not have thought of, and that is um, we have, um, you know, obviously our, our um, venues um, have been impacted by COVID and things like movie theaters and, and other venues. Do you foresee an opportunity for movie theaters to have competitive um, you know, esports uh, tournaments or gaming opportunities in those venues? Absolutely. <clears throat> I mean, that was the concept of bringing the computer laboratory to the Waipahu Library. So it could happen anywhere. And I think, um, you know, <laughs> I've never thought of the theater as being a place. However, they certainly have the infrastructure to attract and raise awareness, um, but also to showcase, you know, what's possible. Because I can just imagine, right, a competitive gaming event happening locally at the theater where, um, people can come and watch as well. I think that would be something, um, I think that would definitely, it's a great idea. Uh, but I also think like with our sporting venues too, you know, when you look at what's happening stateside, some of the stadiums <laughs> uh, sell out for the League of Legends championships or for, for any of them, right? I mean, the popularity is just so big, it's hard to ignore. Um, so I think there are definitely a lot of opportunities to take advantage of commercial spaces. Sure. And, you know, of course, the most important commercial space for Hawaii is Aloha Stadium. And, <laughs> and it's uh, actually demolition, which will happen in the near future, I think, and construction of a new venue. Um, what are your thoughts regarding having... Um, esports events there i think the i think it's slated to um maybe be built by 2027 i mean extracting into the future what are your thoughts about that oh i think it could be a destination again think about the overwatch championships happening at the university of hawaii i mean what other uh, what other game many publishers could we you know entice with having the championships culminate in a venue like Aloha Stadium. Um, I think the infrastructure would, is, is there. Um, and again, I feel as though Hawaii as a destination for that it is a really big opportunity for us. Sure. Now, what, what sport did you play in college? I played football. <laughs> okay. So yeah. if you're looking at like the, when you're, uh, a legislator and you're discussing this or if you're if you're one of the decision makers or if you're testifying on it you know i think we most people think about traditional sports and and the st stadium do you think that if they're only talking about traditional sports when they talk about the stadium that maybe they're not really addressing the reality of future entertainment? No, potentially. I think, <clears throat> I think mainstream sports, right, especially football, basketball, um, I, those are just, you know, it's, it's, it's here to stay. I mean, it's a way of life, right? However, the culture of esports is also here to stay. Uh, I mean, and, you know, sometimes you could consider it, when you talk about esports, you could consider it a subculture because there's so many people that don't know the details around how popular it is. And again, just the phenomenon that it is. So maybe, you know, there's an opportunity. However, I think you could test, um, you know, like in, in some kind of pilot capacity, um, how, how uh, what opportunity is there to bring 
a real uh, championship, like with one of the larger titles to Hawaii to be played at Aloha Stadium. So there are many ways to test that. And PAX is trying to be involved with the quote unquote testing of that to measure like what, what is the real opportunity and how to quantify. So what other initiatives is PAX uh, working on in relation to esports in Hawaii and gaming in Hawaii? We are considering a tournament, a, a competitive tournament that will culminate in some type of scholarship for those that play. I mean, this is very early um, because I saw, you know, and I can see as compared to, like I said, mainstream athletics, like football, basketball, baseball, et cetera. Um, I'm not sure that esports is there yet um, nationally where we would offer or educational institutions offer full scholarships um, to play. Um, so I was, you know, envisioning that we could have a competitive tournament that would culminate in some type of scholarships for those that are 18 and under and looking to go to college. Um, just in Hawaii, it's a very similar concept to, you know, um, having tournaments for high school students. Um, and there are official, you know, it is part of the uh, Hawaii High School Athletics Association now uh, when you consider esports. So again, we're just trying to create opportunity and awareness to see what's possible for businesses, for players, um, and for the community. Sure. And, you know, I understand that there's about 400 um, esports university programs across the country. So do you think Hawaii is keeping up with that? I think, you know, again, University of Hawaii, and between them and what Hawaii Pacific University has, we're, we're definitely keeping up. I mean, again, I believe UH competes in the Mountain West and we win <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're really good. And if you've seen, of course, you've probably seen what's happening or what HPU has done um, with their arena. And that is nothing short of incredible. I mean, the, what they have and what they afford to students and, other, and the community in general, um, it's really high tech. <laughs> Uh, when, when you consider esports. So I think we're at the curve or even ahead of it in some regard. Yeah, you know, what's interesting is um, University of Hawaii, West Oahu has an incredible esports facility. So, you know, that's, a, that's another, have you had a chance to go out there? Yes, yes, I've seen it. Yeah, tremendous. Again, it's, again, we're at the curve, we're past it, you know, and so the opportunities are there. Um, I think it's about bringing it together, right? To find out what is the collective opportunity between everybody who's, you know, raising awareness. So is PAXA involved with AI um, in <laughs> Yeah, yes, <laughs> yes, good question. So through one of our partners, um, Microsoft, who has made some really early, early investments um, into open AI and now the, enveloping AI into their uh, commercial product, um, their commercial public cloud product called Azure. Um, we are definitely involved, um, but we're treading, we're treading carefully. We're treading carefully to find out what's the responsibility look like going forward and how to implement any type of AI responsibly. Sure, you know, that is a, a big part of it, but another um, AI seems to be the, you know, the topic of the day and the topic of maybe a couple months ago or maybe four months ago was um, metaverse. So uh, what are your thoughts about, um, about your involvement in the metaverse and what's going on? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting as well. I'm, I, I, would, I would really want to kind of narrow, narrow it down to what I'd like to see with AI and esports um, is if the AI was good enough, right? And we've all experienced how 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 great um, you know 
generative AI is through ChatGPT. Um, but as it evolves, I would hope to see human, uh, a human <laughs> challenge on the AI and beat it. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, that would be a real testament to how, how competitive um, and how good some of these professional esports players actually are. And it would put it into an order of magnitude, right? To say and showcase how exceptional these players are. Fantastic. So if um, if someone inter is interested in contacting PAXA, how can they do that? Oh, go to our website. Um, it's pitpaxa.com uh, slash contact. And all our information is, is readily available there. All right. And uh, so, Kelly, thank you so much for being my guest today. We've learned a lot. <laughs> thank you, Catherine. Thank you for having me. Good insights. All right. So uh, thank you to our, our um, viewers for joining us today. Uh, next two weeks from now, Tom Leonard will be hosting a show. And uh, we'll see you then. Aloha. <laughs>